Uh, we're just wrapping up final exams here at UVM, so we've got about a little over 100 students in our Intro to GIS class. So if it's okay, what I'm going to do is cancel this session and just distribute the exams among all of us here. And I thought we could maybe do some crowdsource grading, and, and I think we'll be able to bang out everything in about 20 minutes, uh, if that sounds good, because I've got about a noon dead uh, deadline tomorrow. Uh, anyway, I'm here to talk about forest fragmentation. I think really the challenges in mapping forest fragmentation because of all the new technologies that we have available to us. So uh, in the spatial analysis lab um, here at UVM, we are, you know, we're, we're armchair foresters, right? We're trying to do things from the comfort of the soft glow of our, of our computer monitors because we're afraid of, of being outside. And, you know, the good news is that nowadays we've got wonderful new data sets that enable us to map features on the Earth's surface with so much more detail than ever before. And a lot of the work that we've been doing in collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service has been in these heterogeneous, heavily urbanized landscapes. And so here's an example of a LIDAR surface model. Here's an example of high-resolution imagery. And then here's the type of high-resolution land cover data set that now we're mapping these days through a combination of both automated feature extraction and then with our uh, undergraduate students fueled up on Red Bull and Cheetos. And so it's really remarkable, this amount of detail. And this is really advantageous because if we take a look and we want to consider things like forest fragmentation or forest patches, if we take something like NLCD, the National Land Cover Data Set, which is what you see here, and then we go to the exact same area and we look at our high resolution data set, we're really able to see so much more. Not only more of the tree canopy, so that it just doesn't fall into these developed classes, but also more of the nuances and the gaps in the tree canopy. But um, you know, I think it was the notorious B.I.G. who said, you know, mo money, mo problems. And the, that also translates into data. Higher resolution data also creates new problems. And so if we take a look at this particular area from some uh, high resolution forest mapping we've done in Maryland and as part of a NASA funded project with our collaborators from the University of Maryland looking at biomass, this is leaf on one meter imagery, right? Color infrared, and we can clearly see this, this sort of forest patch existing in our urbanized area there. And we also have LIDAR data. Many are familiar with this. It's an active sensor that's flown from above, shoots out a laser. The challenge is that LIDAR data is acquired under leaf off conditions. So I just want you to take a look at some of these trees here, right? These are all deciduous trees. These are kind of like the, the real happy, broad deciduous trees. They don't have competitors, so they've got really thick branching. And then take a look at this forest patch here. And then let's go to the LIDAR surface model, right? Where black is gray around, white things are tall, and it, it looks here, right, like there's, there's all this missing tree canopy in there, but here, these trees show up really clearly. And that's due to the branching patterns and the fact that LIDAR is acquired under leaf-off conditions, right? Why is it acquired under leaf-off conditions? Typically, the mandate for LIDAR by the USGS is to map our bare earth or our topographic surface, which is not ideal for mapping tree canopy. So in these cases where you think it's sort of simple to map gaps and in the forest or to map forest patches using these amazing data sets, it actually becomes complicated. And for those of you that are remote sensing, you know, we have something called NDVI, the Normalized Digital, uh, more Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. If we take NDVI and we just say, if you're tall and you have high NDVI, this is what we end up with, a very poor representation of the tree canopy as opposed to what we want which is something that looks like this. Okay, so these are the challenges that we're facing with these new data. They don't necessarily solve our problems. Now take that and then you go from a 30 meter pixel, 900 square meters, which is how we've mapped things with Landsat, down to one meter, and suddenly for the same given area, we have 900 times as much data. So there's computing resources associated uh, with this, right? But we're also doing some interesting work nowadays doing things like building extraction. This is some 3D buildings that we've developed for the city of Burlington. Tie that into individual tree and height segmentation that we see here. And then also translating the data into forest patches. Okay, and forest patches are very, very 
difficult because everyone has a different definition of, of what's a patch. And it's very, it's very qualitative at times, right? It's sort of, a, you know, to paraphrase a Supreme Court ruling, you know, I know a forest patch when I see one, right? And that's true in this area. And if we, if we unleash this imagery on all of you, all of you might delineate forest patches differently. And that may depend on your particular goals, how many categories you want, and all those types of things. So when we step back and we think about how we've looked at forest fragmentation, how we've done forest patch mapping in the past, it's largely been on 30 meter resolution data, right, which is wonderful. It has a lot of advan advantages. The Landsat program, for example, has been in operation since the 70s. We have a wonderful record. It's hitting most places on the Earth's surface every 16 days, so we've got very high temporal resolution. But when it comes to detecting the very fine scale fragmentation, particularly that we have here in Vermont, okay, and we go to one meter, right, a lot of things start to pop up. So as we go back to 30 meter, these small, maybe significant, but still small forest fragmentation that's happening is really not detectable. And so when we look at something like the National Land Cover data set at 30 meters, a lot of stuff gets aggregated up. And, and this is good, once again, for tracking things over time, but it may not help us understand the impacts of all these small unit developments in the state of Vermont, particularly when it really looks like this. So we're in the process right now of developing a, um, a sub-meter high-resolution land cover data set for the state of Vermont. And so this is what it looks like here. This is the same area as the, as the national land cover data set if we move back and forth here. So what you're going to notice here is we're picking up things like individual buildings, individual driveways. So not only are we able to have a more detailed map, but we're able to develop a better understanding of these, of these fragments compared to if we go back to something like the national land cover data set, which is good on one hand, but then, you know, as I'll talk about, it really has opened up a, another sort of can of worms here. And so then this gets into defining forest patches. And sometimes when you have 30 meter data, it's actually a lot easier to define a, a forest patch. You can run some fairly simple raster algorithms. When you go down to a meter or sub-meter, suddenly you have all this tree canopy that's intertwined. For example, you can't just do an area threshold on your tree canopy. Most of our tree canopy in Burlington is actually connected when viewed from above, right? And we saw that in that Maryland slide. All these street trees, their canopies actually connect. That doesn't mean they're a large forest patch, okay? It just means from above they have connected canopies. So it's really challenging. So if we just come to sort of campus here, there we have the hospital, there we have Centennial Field, right? And if you just take a look at this canopy and you see how it actually all flows together. But we have patches in here. And then we have different types of breaks in these patches. We've got sometimes fragmentation on the edge of these patches due to residential areas. And some people might be maybe managing under here and there might be lawn under there. And then we've got more things in the natural state. And then we've got clearing due to utility lines. And this becomes so tricky to understand here. And especially when we bring in data sets such as LIDAR, even though we can get at this nice high resolution land cover that we've done here, then it's de deciding like at what point does something become a patch? For example, this is back to the NLCD here, right? You can see that it's, it's kind of nicer in a way, right? It makes it easy. It's just, well, it's, it's a patch or it's not a patch as opposed to our high resolution canopy where all this stuff flows together. So we have to make some real difficult decisions in the high resolution. We have to take a look at these areas where we have these very small gaps. We can understand if they're natural or anthropogenic sometimes by the underlying land cover, but it's really tricky to decide where a patch ends and where a patch begins. We can also see that here. You know, where's the cutoff, right, for where's a patch? Should this little thing here still be part of this patch even though it goes into a residential area? LIDAR is great, but we can't always understand if someone's, for example, mowing underneath those trees or not. And so here's an example of a, of a cut on forest patch mapping here. We've got the green as the larger patches. We'll consider the orange to be sort of medium patches and then the purple to be the small patches. And I think all of us, once again, if we sat down and looked at this, maybe we'd be happy with it for a few seconds. And if I scroll away quickly, that's good. But the longer you stare at it, the more you become annoyed by it, right? And you'd like to say, well, what about this thing here? What about this thing here? So the challenge we have with high resolution is suddenly we all become mapping experts because we can see it in the 30 meter data, which is really, really difficult to see. So that's some of the work we've been doing. The other thing that's been really exciting about having the high resolution data is our ability to detect very, very fine scale disturbances over time. So let's take a look at an area here 
and then someone goes in and puts in a major roadway, all right? So our ability to take these data now and map change over time. And so here we have yellow that have things that have remained unchanged in the canopy, and then the purple represents areas that have been removed. And not only can we pick up all of that major canopy loss along the roadway, but then you just take a look at the residential areas here and our ability to track change over time and map removals of tree canopy in these residential areas. And then also you'll notice maybe some little green dots there and those are areas of new growth. So we've got these unique abilities to track those changes um, over time as well. And I'll just wrap up by saying here, you know, that one the thing about resolution is that you always seem to want more of it. And here's some imagery that's acquired pretty close in time down in Plainfield, Vermont. And here we have one meter imagery, which we always dreamed for. Um, but now we've got these drones and we can go down to 30 centimeter imagery. So our ability here, right, to actually tell what's happening in this area and observe, in this case, a logging operation, right? If we just flip back and forth between these two, it's amazing. But we do need to keep in mind that we shouldn't get into these debates of deciding what technology is better. Drones are very, very good when we want to map very small areas very, very quickly when we want to. We're not going to use that for the state of Vermont. We're certainly not going to do it for the whole northern forest. Our LIDAR and the imagery that we have at one meter resolution is also fantastic, but only recently have we achieved LIDAR for the state of Vermont, right? It's not going to happen on a regular basis. So although we may find problems sometimes with the 30 meter data, we have to remember that we can begin to look at that stuff easily on an annual basis. And I think the future is going to be how do we combine these things to perhaps use this coarser resolution data that has a higher temporal resolution, meaning it's acquired more often, to tip us off, to let us know these areas where change might be happening so that we can enable and activate our other sensors, whether it's our drones or something else. So I tried to be really quick today, largely because I have to get back to grading, but also because surveys from Previous FEMC conferences have said we prefer he doesn't talk for more than 10 minutes. Um, but I am I am very interested in in hearing um, you know your thoughts about tracking forest fragmentation. And I did want to leave some time so hopefully we can have a discussion because, like I said, as soon as we go to that higher resolution, we start to pick up these tiny little gaps in the forest. And sometimes those gaps are natural. Sometimes they're anthropogenic, right? And how do we how do we handle them? And and what really represents you know, forest fragmentation nowadays. So thanks. Yes. Just wanted to talk a little bit about ground truthing as well as we move towards higher resolution data sets and if that's that, yeah, that, sound, that sounds like we'd have to go outside, which is really uncomfortable. I mean, no, no climate control, um, no chairs. So, um, no, I think, I think, you know, what, one of the things that when we go to high resolution is that, is that it does, on some cases, um, mean that we, we don't need as much sort of reference data or ground reference collection as we did with, as we did with Landsat. But um, I think when you talk about drone technology, right, it's a way to couple, if you're going out to the field and you're doing field plots, so um, 10 years ago, right, we, all of us, when we went out to do field work, we started bringing GPSs along, right? Why would you not record the exact location if you're going out there? Well, I think now we're getting to the point where why wouldn't you record the exact location and why wouldn't you just send a drone out to also capture a picture? So I think that's a, that's a way where we couple these technologies and not look at them as a replacement for field work, but rather a way to augment the field work. And it's very important to keep in mind when you think about our remote sensing technology, remote sensing technologies, as amazing as the high resolution stuff is, you know, we're not getting at species, we're not getting at health, we're, we can infer things like DBH, but, you know, we're not very, we're not very good at it, especially in the northern forest where we've got these interlocking canopies. So our ability to do, or our need for ground data collection is absolutely crucial. And the, it's not about putting these technologies against, or these methods against each other, but it's how do we combine them to get a better understanding of our, of our forest. Yeah, Bill. It seems like you're finally at the point now with a high resolution imagery that you could map out edge effects and interior conditions really accurately in a way that's never been done before. And you can think about edge effects in a really sophisticated way, you know, not just a single distance or sort of depth of penetration, yeah. but variable depending on the kind of edge effect you're talking about. Microclimate, you know, 
invasive species, vector nest predation, whatever it might be, and you could apply these different sort of distance functions and really map out interior habitats in a really sophisticated way. And I was wondering if you thought about doing that now. Yeah, we've started looking at doing that. But the problem is with the high resolution data is the computing time it takes to do things. So, you know, the nice thing about the 30 meter data is because it's so coarse, you can kind of process a state and do forest patch mapping. The issue we're running into right now in order to process and do like our forest patch mapping for the state of Vermont, we've got to tile it up so we can distribute it to multiple computing cores. As soon as you do that, you're messing with the very sort of edge effect that you're trying to you're trying to map, right? And so this is why, like all the cool stuff, right? If you're on social media like Facebook, right? Some of you have noticed like Facebook's tagging your tagging your face, and you just think, oh, there's this cool artificial intelligence technology. You know, why can't we do that for forests? All Facebook has to worry about is that tiny little picture, right? For forests and for things like fragmentation or edge effects, we're really concerned about a, a much broader view. And so some of the artificial intelligence methods and some of the scaling methods that we use to make these computationally efficient uh, cause problems. This is why the higher resolution data, which we certainly can do these things, but it does get really tricky when we want to scale it up to, to larger areas, right? Just to give you an idea, we do uh, forest and um, tree canopy mapping in New York City. When we map New York City, that data set is 13 times the size as that NLCD, the 30 meter resolution land cover, is for the entire US. So just New York City has 13 times more pixels than the entirety of the national land cover data set. So when you think about doing something like edge effects in New York City, which they're very interested in, because they actually have old growth in New York City, right? They need 13 times the computing power, okay? Maybe even more than someone who wanted to do the same thing for the entire United States at 30 meter resolution, right? And that's, and that's, not, that's not insignificant and poses a lot of challenges. Yeah, so thanks for that question. Yeah. So at these high resolutions, um, in addition to LIDAR and multi spectral, do you find other data sources informing and helping you like make the small patch things? I think like rose layers. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think so. What's nice nowadays is that we're we're no longer really beholden to working with a single sensor, and we're really fortunate here in Vermont, where you know it's a state of free love and GIS, where our E911 point data sets are publicly available, right? So we know the locations of all the what all the structures should be. We then in turn use that to inform our building extraction, especially because a lot of the uh, sort of fragments that we want to detect are structures under tree canopy. So we can use those to help us determine is that really a building in the LIDAR under the tree canopy or not. So these other data sets, whether they're the E911 driveways or E911 points are really important. And these data sets also give us insight to where fragmentation might be occurring. So something like E91, which is maintained on a regular basis, can give us some pretty nice insights as to where uh, new developments are happening. And, that's, and those data sets are going to be updated more frequently than something like LIDAR data, for instance. Any other questions? No. Yeah. Really? I don't have a very good legal background or understand that. You see these data sets have issues privacy or like that. No, so yeah, it's a good question, especially when people think about drones, right? The idea of privacy always comes up. So right now we've probably, you know, any given day if you stand outside, you're gonna get imaged by uh, tens and tens of different satellites probably being operated by about a dozen countries. Some of those, if you're willing to swipe your credit cards, will be able to get about 20 to maybe 30 seconds of, of real-time video. Um, in Vermont, right, we've had a statewide aerial mapping program since the 40s. Um, we have an agreement with, this, with uh, Russia where our spy planes and their spy planes are allowed to uh, operate in each other's countries for nuclear proliferation mapping. So we have Russians that capture aerial imagery. They're not just fixing our ele elections, they're also mapping our, <laughs> our country, right? They're involved in, in uh, many ways. So, so there's all this stuff that's going on and these are just other ones. And I think my time is uh, up, so we'll end there, so thanks. <laughs>